Hi, so today we are going to discuss about cell culture and cell line basics. So what is cell culture? Cell culture refers to the removal of cells from an animal or plant and their subsequent growth in a favorable artificial environment. The cells may be removed from the tissue directly and disaggregated by enzymatic or mechanical means before cultivation. Or they may be derived from a cell line or cell strain that has already been already established. Cell culture may be further divided in, into three categories, primary culture, cell line, and cell strain. So what is primary culture? Primary culture refers to the stage of culture after the cells are isolated from the tissue and proliferated under the appropriate conditions until they occupy all the available substrate. At this stage, the cells have to be subcultured by transferring them to a new vessel with fresh growth medium to provide more room or more space for continued growth. Cell line. After the first subculture, the primary culture become known as a cell line or subclone. Cell line derived from primary culture have a limited life span. And as they are processed, cells with the highest growth capacity predominate, resulting in a degree of genotypic and phenotypic uniformity in the population. Now, what is cell strain? Cell strain is um, if a subpopulation of a cell line is positively selected from the culture by cloning or some other method, this cell line becomes a cell strain. A cell strain often acquires additional genetic changes subsequent to the initiation of the parent line. What is the difference between finite versus per, or, and continuous cell line? Normal cells usually divide only a limited number of times before losing their ability to proliferate, which is genetically determined even known as senescence. These cell lines are known as finite cell lines. When a finite cell line undergoes transformations and acquires the ability to divide indefinitely, it becomes a continuous cell line. However, some cell lines become immortal through a process called transformation, which can occur spontaneously or can be chemically or virally induced. Culture conditions are, conditions are very important. Culture's condition vary widely for each cell type. By the artificial environment in which the cells are cultured invariably consists of a suitable basal containing a substrate or medium that supplies the essential nutrients, for example, amino acids, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals growth factors, hormones and gases, oxygen or carbon dioxide, and regulates the physiological environment, for example, pH, osmotic pressure, and temperature. Most cells are encourage dependent and must be cultured by attached to a solid or semi-solid substrate. We call it adherent cells, while others can be grown floating in the culture medium, which is called suspension culture. Cryopreservation. If a surplus of cells are available from, mono, from subculturing, they should be treated with the appropriate protective agents like DMSO or glycerol and is stored at temperature below minus 80 to minus 170, which is called prior cryopreservation. So there are basically several morphological changes happens during cell culture. Uh, cell and culture can be divided into three basic categories based on their shape and appearance, which is called morphology. Fibrobrus-like cells are bipolar or multipolar 
have elongated shapes and grow attached to a substrate. You can see a picture over here. Epithelial-like cells are polygonal in shape and more regular dimensions and grow attached to a substrate in discrete patches. Lymphoblood-like cells, as you can see here, purple image, are spherical in shape and usually grown in suspension without attaching to a surface. What are the basic application of cell culture? There are many applications and cell culture is one of the most applied field of biotechnology. Cell culture is one of the major tools used in cellular and molecular biology. This is an excellent model for studying the normal physiology and biochemistry of cells. For example, metabolic studies and aging are the most common. Uh, the effect of drug and toxic compounds on the cells, which is called toxicity, mutagenesis and carcinogenesis also can be studied. It is also used in drug screening and development and large-scale manufacturing of biological compounds such as vaccines, therapeutics, protein. Uh, the major did. May, the major advantage of using cell culture for any of these applications is the consistency and reproducibility of results that can be obtained from using a batch of clonal cells. There are certain safety measures because safety is highly concerned when you are working in animal, animal cell culture laboratory. Um, in addition to safety risk common to most everyday workplaces, such as electrical and fire hazards, a cell culture laboratory has a number of specific hazards associated with handling and manipulating human or animal cells and tissues, as well as toxic, corrosive, and mutagenic solvents and reagents. The most common of these hazards are accidental punctures with syringe needles or other contaminated sharp spills and splashes onto skin and mucous membranes, ingestion through mouth pipetting, or inhalation exposures to infectious aerosols. So it, you, you have to be very, very careful. The fundamental objective of any biosafety program is to reduce or eliminate exposure of laboratory workers and outside environment to potentially harmful biological agents. The most important element of safety in cell culture laboratory is the strict adherence to standard micro microbiological practices and techniques. There are certain kinds there are certain types of biosafety labors are available. Center for Disease Control and NIH and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, generally, every year they, they publish some uh, biosafety regulations for tissue culture lab. So it can be downloaded on internet if you are interested to read this fully. There are some label of in biosafety parameters which is which can be bsl1 which is biosafety level one two three and further and four bsl1 is the basic level of protections common to the most research and clinical laboratory and is appropriate for agents that are not known to cause disease in normal healthy human so bsl1 where no disease bsl2 BCL2 is appropriate for moderate risk agent known to cause human disease of bearing severity by ingestion or through uh, mucous membrane exposure. Most cell culture lab should be at least BSL2, but the exact requirement depends upon the cell line use and the type of work conducted. Biosafety level 3 is for indigenous or exotic agents with a known potential aerosol transmission 
and for agents that may cause serious and potentially lethal infections. BSL-4 is for tox is for exotic agents that pose a high individual risk of life-threatening disease by infection aerosols or for which no treatment is available. These agents are restricted to high contaminant laboratory. BSL-4 uh, is a very rare laboratory and in all over the world there are very few laboratories, some of them very famous in Australia, in Netherlands and United States. Generally they work with animal viruses but still we do not know. Okay, let's go further. So what are the safe laboratory practices? Well, always bear appropriate personal protective equipment like gloves, change gloves when contaminated and dispose of used gloves with other contaminated laboratory waste. Don't use your gloves continuously for, for many days. Wash your hands after working with potential hazardous material or before leaving the lab. Okay. Do not eat, drink, smoke or handle contact lenses when you are working in the lab or apply cosmetics which is very common in girls or store foods for human consumption in laboratory. Okay. You don't have to eat biscuits and cookies and juices in the lab. Uh, follow the in institution policies. Okay. Uh, it's very important while hand it is very important to care while handling needle needles scalpels pipettes and broken glass spears okay uh decontaminate all work surfaces before and after your experiments and immediately after any spills or splash of potential infections infectious material with an appropriate disinfectant Clean laboratory equipments routinely, even if it is not contaminated. And finally, decontaminate all potential infection material before disposal. Okay, don't just pack up and, and send to a trash. Okay, what are the basic biological contaminations in tissue culture lab? Um, a specific requirement for a cell culture uh, cell culture um, laboratory in terms in order to maintain biological contamination um, it's a very very important part so <clears throat> there are several kinds of contamination okay that your media or your culture can have So, there are some biological contaminants which are very common like bacteria, molds, yeast, viruses, mycoplasmas, okay, and as well as cross-contamination by other cell lines. While it is uh, impossible to eliminate contamination entirely, it is possible to reduce its frequency and seriousness by gain, gaining a, through a thorough understanding of their sources and by following good aseptic condition. Successful cell culture depends heavily on keeping the cells free from contamination by microorganism like I mentioned previously. There are several aseptic techniques designed to provide a barrier between microorganism in, in, the, in the environment and the trial cell culture. Uh, Australia barcaria maintain a very high personal hygiene. They trial all the reagents and media. So one of the very common infectious agent in tissue culture is bacteria. Bacteria are the large number of ubiquitous group of unicellular organisms. You can find bacteria everywhere. They are typically a few micrometer in diameter and can have a variety of shapes. 
Bacterial contamination is easily detected by visual inspection of cultures within a few days of its become infected. Infected culture usually appears cloudy or turbid, sometimes with a thin layer on the surface. It can also be identified by sudden drop in the pH of culture medium, which is frequently encountered uh, under a low microscope. Under a low power microscope, you can observe bacteria growth. For example, uh, in this picture, you can see a clear difference, not very clear, but uh, at least how bacteria grow in a um, 293 cell, which is E. coli. So in this picture, basically, a uh, you can see in this space represented by this block which is very difficult to see there are some cells and this block has been magnified here and you can see there are thousands of E. coli cells okay E. coli is, is a rod shaped bacteria which is about 2 micro micrometer long and, and, and 0 0.5 micropic in diameters okay Another very common bacteria, uh, sorry, bacteria, no, microorganism is yeast. Yeast is a unicellular eukaryotic cell. Uh, it's a fungi. They are up to 40 micrometers. Okay. And in this picture, you can see 293, the same cell as previous image, pre previous photo. And you can see it is contaminated by by yeast, and this this can be easily because it is the size is quite big. Okay, so this 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 is a contaminated culture. Uh, basically, yeast generally do not produce or very little change in pH, but contamination but the culture contaminated by yeast becomes heavy uh, you can observe some spherical particles or bud of smaller particles by microscope in your cultures yeast grow very fast so in within 2 24 hours you can you can observe the growth of yeast molds they are eukaryotic microorganism too and also in the kingdom of fungi that grows as a multicellular filaments called, hy called hy hyphae. Uh, they generally grow in connected network and they are they are uh, for they produce filaments. Similar to yeast contamination, the pH of the culture remains stable in the initial stage of contamination and that rapidly increases as the culture become more heavily infected and become turbid. Under microscopy the mycelia usually appear as thin filaments and sometimes as denser clumps of spores. So for example in this picture you can see a uh, uh, mycoplasma sorry this is mycoplasma molds I, I i couldn't put a picture anyways they are they are pretty similar like like yeast another contaminant biological contaminant is virus virus are microscopic infectious agents that take over the whole cell machinery to reproduce their extremely small size makes them very difficult to detect in culture and to remove them from reagents used in cell culture laboratories. Uh, most of the virus have very stringent requirements for their host. They are usually do not adversely affect cell culture from a species other than their host. However, using virally infected cell culture can present a serious health hazard to the laboratory personnel. So we have to be very careful if you find something infected with virus, especially if humans or primate cells are cultured in laboratory. Viral infections of cell culture can be detected by electron microscope. 
immunostaining by antibodies ELISA or PCR. So viral infection generally is it's difficult to detect mycoplasmas. They are simple bacteria. They lack a cell wall, but they, they, they are not protoplast. They are bacteria. And they are considered the smallest self-replicating organism. They're, they are very, very small in size. Because of their extremely small size, even less than one micrometer, micro, they are very difficult to detect until they achieve extremely high densities and cause the cell culture to deteriorate. Uh, there are often no visible sign of infections. Mm, chronic mycoplasma infections might manifest themselves with the decreased rate of cell proliferation. Um, however, the only assured way of detecting mycoplasma contamination is by testing the culture periodically using fluorescent staining. Most, most common fluorescent staining is HOECHST. 33258, HOST33258, or ELISA, or PCR, or autoradiography, or some microbiological assays are also available. In this picture, you can see a, free, um, a, a healthy culture cell, and in this case, you can see the cells are being infected with mycoplasma. Okay, and further, it is they are very very dense the the infection is very dense over here and this this is this this contamination was detected by mycoplasma detection kit mycoflor okay not only biological contamination there is also cross contamination not only biological contamination by by previously mentioned microorganism there is cross contamination also important factors uh, obtaining cell lines from reputable cell banks, periodical check, checking of, of your cell lines and practicing good aseptic techniques are the, are the one who will help you to avoid cross-contamination, okay? Because, because cross-contamination uh, can, be, can be happened by another cell lines. Okay, so it's very difficult sometimes uh, to find out, who knows, you are working with two or three different cell lines and for you, it's a single cell line, okay? HELA, H-E-L-A, is the, one of the most famous cell lines and one of the oldest, okay? And, and there are many, many cases where HELA is contaminated by the cell lines. So you, generally people believe Okay, so basically, when you are working with a very sophisticated board, you have you need to identify your cell lines, and there are several methods to do that. So don't basically believe whatever you you have given. Okay, uh, antibiotics should not be used routinely in cell culture because their continuous uses encourages the development and of antibiotic resistant strains. Okay, so this is the basic complaint or basic problem what we are facing nowadays like tuberculosis okay there is MDR multiple multiple drug resistant tuberculosis bacteria so so or in many cases people are infected by drug um, anti, anti, antibiotic resistant bacteria so it's been very very difficult to treat them okay so to to avoid this use of antibiotic is, is, is not recommended. Antibiotics should only be used as a last resort and only for short-term applications. And they should be removed from the culture as soon as possible. If they are used in the long term, antibiotic-free culture should be maintained in parallel as a control for cryptic infections. Okay. <clears throat> cell lines. <clears throat> How to select your cell lines? Consider the following criteria which I have mentioned over here. 
to select an appropriate cell line for your experiments. Always it's going to depend. You don't have to consider all the criteria, all the all the all the factors. Okay, so for example, species. Non-human and non-primate cell lines usually have fewer biosafety restrictions. So try to prefer them. But ultimately your experiments will dictate whether you use a species specific culture or not. Functional characteristics. What is the purpose of your experiment? For example, liver and kidney derived cells lines may be more suitable for toxicity testing. Okay, so it always depends on your experiments and your project. Finite or continuous. What will you choose? Uh, while choosing this, Uh, from finite cell lines may give you more options to express the correct functions. Continuous cell lines uh, are often easier to clone and maintain. Normal or transformed. Transformed cell lines usually have, a, have an increased growth rate and higher plating efficiency. Uh, are continuous and requires less serum in media okay but they have undergone a permanent change in their phenotype through a genetic transformation of uh, growth condition and characteristics so what are your requirements with respect to growth rate okay to growth rate, saturation density, cloning efficiency, and the ability to grow in suspension. For example, to express a recombinant protein in high yields, you might want to choose a cell line with a fast growth rate and, and, and with an ability to grow in suspension. Any other criteria? Well, if you are using a finite cell line, uh, are there sufficient stock available? Is the cell line well characterized or do you have to perform the validation yourself? If you are using an abnormal cell line, you have an equivalent normal cell line that you can use as control. Is the cell line stable? If not, how easy is to clone it and generate sufficient frozen stock for your experiment? So basically, don't afraid by, by many factors. It's always depends on experiments. Anyways, so now you acquire a cell line. You may establish your own culture from primary cells or you may choose to buy established cell culture from commercial or non profit suppliers, from your collaborators or from cell banks. Many cell lines you can buy. Reputable suppliers, some companies provide high quality cell lines that are carefully tested for their integrity and to ensure that the culture is free from contaminants. Okay. Uh, generally, it is advisable uh, against borrowing culture from other laboratories because they carry a high risk of contamination. Regardless of their source, make sure that all that all new cell lines are tested for mycoplasma contamination before you begin to use them. Uh, culture environment. One of the major advantage of cell culture is the ability to manipulate the physiological chemi physio physiochemical factors like temperature, pH, osmotic pressure oxygen and carbon dioxide tension while the physiological environment of culture is not as well as defined as its physiochemical environment a better understanding of components of serum the identification of growth factors necessary for proliferations and a better appreciation of microenvironment of cell in culture now allow the culture of certain cell line in serum free media. <clears throat> so
So now adherent version versus suspension shells. There are there are two basic systems for growing cells cells in culture as monolayers on artificial substrate, which is called adherent sub ad, adherent culture, or free floating in the culture medium suspension culture. The majority of the cells derived from vertebrates with the exception of hemopoietic cell lines and a few others are enzyme dependent and have to be cultured on a suitable substrate that is specifically treated to allow cell adhesion and spreading tissue culture treated, for example, tissue culture treated. However, many cell lines can be adopted for suspension culture. Similarly, most of the commercial available insect cell lines grow well in monolayer or suspension culture. Cells that are cultured in suspension can be maintained in culture flasks and are not tissue culture treated. But as the culture volume of surface area is increased beyond which adequate gas exchange is hindered, the medium requires agitations, and this agitation is usually achieved with a magnetic stryer or rotating spinner flask. So, what are the advantage or disadvantage from both kind of cells? For example, adherent cell culture uh, is used for cytology, harvesting products continuously and for many other research applications and in case of suspensor culture they are used in case of production of proteins batch harvesting and other applications adherent culture adherent culture is appropriate for most cell types including primary culture uh, they requires periodic passages but also allow easy visual inspections under inverted microscope. Uh, but adherent cell culture, they have a limited, limited growth by surface area, which may limit products yield. That's why suspension culture is used for the production of proteins or other products. Suspension culture are appropriate for cells adapted to suspension culture and few other cell lines that are non-adhesive like hemopoietic cells. They are very easy to pass, means easy to subculture, but requires daily cell counts and viability determination to follow growth patterns. Uh, they does not require enzymatic or mechanical dissociation okay because they are not adhered adhered cells okay so basically this is the basic difference in both kind of cell lines uh, media um the culture media is most important components of the culture environment because it provides a naturally necessary nutrients growth factors hormones um Although initial cell culture experiments were performed using natural media obtained from tissue extracts and body fluids, the need of standardization, media quality, and increased demand lead to the development of defined media. The, there are three basic classes of media: are basal media, reduced serum media, and serum pre media. Uh, basically, they differ. They differ in their requirements for supplementation with serum. Serum is everywhere because it's vitally important as a growth of gro a source of growth and addition factors, hormones, lipids, and minerals for the culture of cell in basal media. In addition, serum also regulates cell membrane permeability and serves as a carrier for lipids, enzymes, micronutrients, and trace elements into the cell. The exact function of serum is not known. However, using serum in media has a number of disadvantages, including high cost, problem with standardization, specificity, variability, and unwanted effects such as stimulation on inhibition of growths 
and or cellular functions on certain cell culture. If the serum is not obtained from reputable source, contamination can also pose a serious threat to successful cell culture experiments. Basal media. Uh, the majority of cell lines grow well in basal media, which contain amino acids, vitamins, inorganic salts, and a carbon source such as glucose. But these kind of media formula this kind of media formulation must be further supplemented with serum to to have a good growth. Uh, reduced serum media, we are here. It's another strategy to reduce the undesired effect of serum in cell culture experiments. Reduced serum media are basal media formulation enriched with nutrient and animal derived factors which reduce the common, sorry, which reduce the amount of serum that is needed. Uh, serum free media, serum free media, uh, basically their formulation exists for many primary culture and cell lines, including recombinant proteins pro producing cell lines. Uh, one of the very famous is Chinese hamster ovary, uh, various hybridoma cell lines, the insect cell lines SF9 and SF21 from Sodoptera, Sodoptera and for cell lines that act as host for viral productions like Barrow 293, MDBK and MDCK. These are the these are the memory cell lines. One of the major advantage of using serum-free media is the ability to make them make the media selective for a specific cell type. What are the advantage of serum-free media? Uh, they have increased definition. They have more consistent performance. They have easier purification and downstream processing. They have increased productivity. They have better control over physiological response. And they have enhanced detection of cellular mediators. But they also have some disadvantage. For example, they need uh, they need very high degree of reagent purity. Sometimes growth is slow. And their requirement for cell type specific media formulation. Formulation. So this is these are the basic disadvantages. Uh, pH. You know very well what is pH. However, some transformed cell lines have been shown to grow better as at slightly more acidic environment like uh, near a pH of 7 to 7.4 and some normal fibroblast cell line prefer slightly more basic environment from 7.4 to 7.7 uh, specifically insect cell lines such as SF9 and SF21 grow optimally at pH of 6.2 Carbon dioxide. Uh, usually, this work as a buffering agent. Okay, uh, because the pH of medium is dependent on the delicate balance of dissolved carbon dioxide and bicarbonate (HCO3). Um, changes in the atmospheric CO2 can alter the pH of medium. Therefore, it is necessary to use exogenous CO2 when using media buffered with CO2 bicarbonate based buffer. Specifically, if the cells are cultured in open dishes or transformed cell lines are cultured at high concentrations. Uh, most researchers usually use 5 to 7 percent of CO2 in air and 4 to 10 percent CO2 is most common for cell culture experiments. Uh, temperature, you know temperature is another a very important factor. Um, most human and mammalian cell lines are maintained at 36 to 37 for optimal growth. However, insect cell line 
are cultured at 27 degrees for optimal growth. They grow more slowly at lower temperature and the temperature between 27 and 30 degrees centigrade. If you increase the temperature more than 36 degrees centigrade, the viability of insect cell decreases and cells do not recover even after they are returned to 27. Okay. Avian cell lines, birds, requires 38.5 30, degrees centigrade for maximum growth. Well, these cells can also be maintained at 37, but they will grow more slowly. Okay. Uh, some very special cell lines like from cold-blooded animals like amphibians, cold water fish, tolerate a by temperature range between 15 degrees centigrade and 26 degrees centigrade. It's very important to note out that cell culture conditions vary for each cell type. Okay, so these parameters are always differs. Cell morphology. Uh, basically, regular examination is is highly recommended. Okay. Uh, but signs of deterioration of cell include gra um, some granulations around the nucleus, um, also detachment of the cells from the substrate, and cytoplasm evacuations. These are the basic signs. Okay. Uh, some some signals or signs of deterioration may be caused by a variety of reasons, including contamination of the culture, uh, senescence of the cell lines, or the presence of any toxic compound toxic compounds in the media. For example, you we can see some some kind of cell lines. Mammalian cells, in case of mammalian cells, you can see here a morphology of 293 cells. It's a very common cell lines. Uh, the cell, can, cell lines can be buy from many commercial suppliers or, or can, be, can be obtained by some, some, some cell, cell culture databases. Uh, in, specifically, in this, in this cell line, uh, 293 cell line is a permanent line, okay, and it has been established from primary embryonic human kidney, uh, which was transferred with sheer human adenovirus type 5 DNA. The adenoviral gene expressed in the cell line allows the cell to produce high level of recombinant proteins. So it is a production cell line. Here you can see the phase contrast images. Uh, where you can see the same kind of cell growing in two uh, two different kind two different media, or you can say in two different type types of culture. Uh, in this case, you will see the healthy 293 cell in adherent culture. Okay, and here you will see the same cell line but growing in suspension. Okay, in suspension they they appear more round. Okay, and more separated. Insect cells, uh, one of the very common insect cells is SF21. Uh, it's it's, um, it's an ovarian cell iso uh, isolated from uh, Spodotera, which is called fall army bomb also. They are spher spherical in shape, very, very round, uh, but, but with unequal sizes. These cells can be thought and usually directly used directly in suspension culture for rapid expansion of cells. They grow very fast. Uh, you, um, these cells can be used to propagate viruses and to produce some kinds of recombinant proteins. Uh, in this case, you can see some 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 of very very beautiful cells. Okay, here you can have you can see they are in they are in um, suspension culture. 
using SFM2 media and here you can see them in, in a sorry it's it's suspension culture is here and 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 uh, adherent monolayer is here of uh, another another um, another insect cell line which is a, which is SF9 um, basically isolated from this uh, from uh, Frugiperda and it is suitable uh, host for expression of recombinant proteins from baculovirus expression system. Um, although insect cells have been historically cultured in stationary systems utilizing T flask and serum supplemented basal medium, these cells are generally non anchorage dependent and can easily be maintained in suspension culture. So they are not, not uh, most of the time, they are not adherent. They also they are they also look beautiful in these pictures in 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 adherent monolayer or or in suspension uh, so what is subculture well subculture is is can be defined as a pas passaging passaging or uh, removal of the medium and transfer of cells from previous culture into a fresh growth medium uh, the growth of cells in culture proceeds from the leg phase from the here you can see a growth curve okay uh, is a growth pattern of cultured cell uh, generally cell growth in a leg phase when the cells in adherent culture occupy all the available substrate and have no space for expansion or when the cell in suspension culture exceed the capacity of medium to support for the growth cells proliferation is great greatly reduced or seizes entirely to keep them an optimal density for continued growth and to stimulate further proliferation the culture has to divide it and fresh medium supplied so this is subculturing okay providing space and new supplement media uh, here you can see in in this growth curve the first phase of growth after the culture is seeded is the leg phase which is a period of slow growth when the cells are adapting to culture environment and preparing for growth the phase is is, is um, immediately followed by phase uh, this this is the log phase it is not mentioned here i'm sorry for this photo but uh, this is this is the log phase basically log phase is is from here to this space okay so log phase is is basically from the cells starts growing fast and until finishing of the un until starting of the stationary phase uh, in log phase, uh, cells proliferate exponential, exponentially and consume the nutrients in, of the growth media. When all the growth media is spent or one or more nutrients is depleted or when the cell occupy all the available substrate, the cell scent enters in the stationary phase okay which is called plateau phase phase where the pro proliferation is greatly reduced or ceases entirely okay so leg phase log phase exponential phase and stationary phase when we have to subculture uh, the basic criteria for determ determining this is, is similar in adherent and in suspension culture. However, there are some differences between mammalian and insect cell lines. In mammalian cell, adherent culture should be passaged when they are in the log phase before they reach confluence. Means 
depletion of media. Normal cell stops growing when they reach confluence and it takes them longer to recover when reseeded. So this is the basic reason. Uh, in case of transform cell, they continue proliferating even after they reach confluence, but they usually deteriorate after about two doublings. Similarly, cells in suspension should be passaged when they are in log phase growth before they reach confluency. When they reach confluency, cells in suspension clump together and medium appears turbid when the culture frost is swirled. In case of insect cells, uh, they should be subcultured when they are in the log phase before they reach confluency. So this, th there is a contrary. While tightly adherent insect cell can be processed at confluency, which allows for easier detachment from the culture basal. Insect cells that are repeatedly passaged at densities past confluency display decreased doubling times, decreased viability and decreased ability to attach. On the other hand, passaging insect cells in adherent culture before they reach confluency requires more mechanical force to dislodge them from the monolayer. So now, exhaustion of medium. Uh, in mammal cell, a drop in the pH of growth media indicate a buildup of lactic acid, which is a byproduct of cellular metabolism. Uh, lactic acids can be toxic to cells, and the decreased pH can be suboptimal for cell growth. The rate of change of pH is generally dependent. On the cell concentration in that culture at high cells concentration exhaust medium faster than cells lower concentration uh, we should subculture our cells if we observe a rapid drop in pH in case of insect cells they are cultured in growth media that are usually more acidic than that those for mammalian cells. For example, in case of TNMFH cells and grace medium use for culturing SF9 cells has a pH of 6.2. Unlike mammalian cell culture, the pH rises gradually as the insect cells grow, but usually does not exceed pH 6.4. However, as with mammalian cells, the pH of growth medium will start falling when insect cell reaches higher densities. Okay, so there are a number of mammary cell lines, continuous cell lines, uh, finite cell lines, or insect cell lines are available in, in everywhere. Okay, um, in mammary cell lines, there are fibroblast epithelial, um, epithelial, then maybe A549, which is lung carcinoma cell line, uh, BHL100, which is another epithelial human breast cell line, uh, Chang is an epithelial human liver cell line, uh, CB1, which is fibroblast monkey kidney cell. Uh, these are the examples of mammalian cell lines. Now, there are some, I, 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 I'm giving you some examples from mammalian cell lines, continued cell line. H9, which is lymphoblast human T cell lymphoma cells. HL60, lymphoblast human leukemia cells. I10, it is epithelial mouse testicular tumor cell. KB, epithelial human oral carcinoma cell. MCF7, epithelial human breast adenoma carcinoma cell. Now some example of insect cell lines. 
SF9, SF21, I already show you, they are ovary cell lines from PAL or MIVOM. Uh, HI5 is another cell lines, another ovary cell lines from cabbage looper and other cell lines which is called DMAIL2 from fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Now how you are going to dissociate your adhering cells, otherwise you are not able to do subculture. The first step in subculturing adhering cells is to detach them from the surface of the culture vessel by enzymatic or mechanical means. Uh, here you can see in this table uh, some methods. Uh, one is shake off when you gently shake or rock the culture basal. In this method, basically, you will lose. Uh, you you can use this method for loosely adhering cells or mitotic cells. Uh, scrapping is, is another method, but it's very time consuming, it's very laborious, and it may damage your cells. The most common use, the most commonly used method is enzymatic dissociation by different enzymes. You can have trypsin, a combination of trypsin, trypsin discollaginase, or separately you can use dispase. Even some, some commercial kits are available in the market that can be used for, for to deattachment of cells. Uh, trypsin it can be used, it's very efficient, but it is toxic in high concentration. So you have to you have to keep that in mind. And they can be used for a strongly adherent cell. A uh, uh, um, uh, uh, very, very common and uh, most um, most cute method is trypsin with collagenase, which can be used for high density culture or culture they have multiple layers, especially uh, fibroblast. Okay, and they, they are not toxic. This is a, as another enzyme and can be used for detachment of epidermal cells as confluent. Uh, even intact sheets can be taken out without uh, dissoci dissociating cells. Okay, so so basically this is this is what I, I have to tell you about about cell lines and cell culture. Okay. Thank you and have a nice day.